our dreams could come true. Yeah. Or what do you so think? is it? So is three eleven a ship? Is it a k- 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 cruise ship? Because you know <laughs> three eleven stands for KKK. You know that, right? Yes. Yes. I yeah. I I knew that. So maybe that's what's on their island. It's a clan island. Now, so do you want me to actually talk about what 311 really means? <laughs> yeah, as soon as I'm done dying over here. Sure. Yeah, what's it really mean? What are you dying for? I don't know. I just all of a sudden have a bronchitis or something. <laughs> oh, See? was you hear that? So I just like bring up 311 and it just causes like a disease. <laughs> I don't know. It is like a... Citizens of Earth, welcome to Accelerative Thrust. I am Dan. Oh, and I'm Eric. And uh, today we're going to talk about we're going to talk about music, aren't we? I mean, that's uh huh. It's kind of part of what we do. Did you know that Hardy's brought back, and you may not have even known that they got rid of them, the cinnamon and raisin biscuits for breakfast. Oh, I figured they had them, but yeah, I remember those from the the nineties. Oh yeah, they were definitely yeah. around in the '90s. They they discontinued them like uh, right before 2020, I think, mm. or maybe even a couple years before 2020. They discontinued them and then wow. replaced them with just a cinnamon roll. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people they they raised their fists and they said, "We want yeah. the cinnamon and raisin biscuits back." Well, I'm glad they listen. You know, yeah. Sometimes sometimes companies don't. And it's really frustrating, like uh, like Skittles. Taste the rainbow. You know, they switched uh, like, out the lime for the green apple, and everyone was like, "Well, that sucks. Please change it back." And they were like, "Nope, we're gonna <laughs> keep it this way for maybe fifteen years or so, and then we're gonna finally change it back to lime, and then everyone's gonna be happy." They replaced lime with green apple. For yeah, real? for like fifteen years. I'm totally serious. Okay, and it sucked. And I didn't have uh, Skittles. <laughs> well, I had Skittles, but I just threw the green ones in the trash. Because, I mean, oh. green apple. I mean, I guess it's a fine flavor on its own. But it's not with the rest of the Skittles. It's like the only thing you can taste. It's like green peppers on a pizza. It's like, well, what's all this other stuff on here for? You can't even taste it anymore. You know? Mm, yeah. Yeah. What is the single most pointless pizza ingredient, do you think? Jeez, I don't know. I mean, p- pizza topping, I guess. I guess technically, probably it's tomato. You oh, know? yeah, if you put tomatoes but on a pizza. I really like tomato. I, I, on pizza I, I don't too, know. So. It, it it adds a different flavor, yeah. especially if it's like sun-dried tomatoes. Oh, yeah, that's good. It adds a different flavor than like the, um, uh, like the sauce. Yeah. But, Man, we're really deep diving into the food today oh yeah no uh well like we were talking to uh new well i guess this episode's gonna yeah, air. in the future we yeah in the future we're we gonna were be talking, talking to, yeah <laughs> we're gonna be talking to new standards <laughs> men in the future yeah and uh i believe it was their drummer said ike. that yeah yeah ike it was ike he mm-hmm. said uh what did he say again i don't know <laughs> it hasn't happened yet dude. yeah no it hasn't happened yeah that's true yeah we're not even in the future yet are we <laughs> no okay we never will be no w- w- yeah there's no way the future is now right if we're there it's the present it's the present yeah so right now this very second every yeah. second yeah is both the past the present and the future or not both. It's yeah. three times the past, the present, and the future. Yeah, with every passing second. Yes, it goes through that cycle. All the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the only past, that's the only present, and that's the only future that's actually existing right. in real time. Yeah. So when people are like, say like, uh, oh, live in the present, it's like, I can't, it just passed. Yeah, it it's just over. passed. Yep, yep, yep. And now it's over. Yeah. Here it comes now. It's over. uh, 
I'll like, live in the future if you don't mind. Yeah. I'll live in the future for one goddamn second and then I'll be in the present and then I'll be in the past. Have you ever tried living in the past? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like the majority of human beings live in the past. Yes, I think so. You're right. Yeah, they hope for the past. They want it to be the same. They're scared of the future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the whole time it's just an illusion, everybody. Yeah. Well, don't worry about me. None of this is real, except, of course, for me. Okay, so music, records. Yeah, music, records. Let's do this. Music, records. It's it's recording <laughs> time. Uh, wait, no. Well, it's been recorded. Record time. That's it. Yeah. Come on, everybody. It's record time. We got ourselves a, uh, <laughs> uh, a whole bunch of stuff to wallow through with these three releases this mm -hmm. week. Okay. All right. So okay. Let's get this started. So my pick uh for this week is from the Reverend Kristen Michael Hater. I learned about this record randomly. I don't even remember how. It was I think I saw a review of it on YouTube and the cover just really kind of like it was interesting to me because it the cover uh, it looks like one of those old like sermon records that you would get from like salvation army or like goodwill or something like that uh but then i found out that this is actually none other than lingua ignata uh we actually reviewed one of her albums a while back mm -hmm. called caligula mm -hmm. and uh it was one of the most abrasive but also just every emotion that you could imagine you know it, it sounded like she was freeing herself from you know a curse and then some things came out like about her personal life since then and you know it, it, you kind of after you hear stuff like that um you go back and you listen to like recordings that were made and I don't want to say that it makes more sense, you know, but it, it, it does shed some light onto, you know, maybe why uh, the feelings and emotions that were being invoked through recordings like that were so intense. Um, but uh, she has come back as the, the Reverend Kristen Michael Hater. Boy, that's a, that's a mouthful. Uh, the name of this record is Saved. And like I said, if you look at the cover of the record, it does look like an old sermon record. It definitely is kind of continuing in some ways on the path of addressing some of her trauma, I think, but in a much different way. Um, there's themes of, uh, obvious themes of, of religion going on here. And... The recording is one of the most fascinating things to me about this record. It definitely seems like it's purposely being done in a in a way that sounds like a uh, like an old like maybe 1920s recording of like a, like an Appalachian religious sect or something. So there's definitely like a uh, a huge gospel influence on here some of the lyrics seem to suggest or some of the content seems to suggest that she's either maybe found religion or has at least been researching it. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I believe I read somewhere that she actually did attend some uh, gospel choirs in churches and did that for research purposes for this album. It's definitely a really interesting evolution or just like an interesting, it's interesting that she went from the lingua ignata persona to this. Some of it is honestly not necessarily that much different in terms of like the sonic end of it and the audio end of it. Like there's this, there's one song where you hear her kind of, for lack of a better way to describe it, 
speaking in tongues in the background while she's kind of singing about, I guess, kind of letting her demons out. I, I, I kind of, kind of at a standstill of how exactly to describe this record. It's, it, it's pretty surprising to me. A couple of the songs are just um, acoustic guitar and her singing with uh, what sounds, sounds like maybe a gospel choir. So it definitely has that old folksy kind of Americana vibe. Some of it is still definitely in the um, sort of dark experimental side of things sonically. Um, her voice doesn't sound too much different, but yeah, the content is definitely um, has definitely shifted and it, it does definitely sound like there still is, you know, her sort of, um, I don't want to say re not, not reliving, but definitely coming to terms with her trauma and what effects it it's had on her life and why she's maybe changing to this sort of thing. I, I don't know if this is something she plans on continuing, uh, you know, just the whole like recording under this name, the uh, Reverend uh, Kristen Michael Hater. Um, I don't know if this is kind of a one-off project for her, but uh, you know, it's very fascinating to me and um, I like it probably just as good, but for different reasons than uh, Lingua Ignata. As far as the things that it reminds me of, I mean, I'm I'm kind of at a loss in, in, in a lot of ways, but it it does remind me of Lingua Ignata. Um, if I didn't know that this was Lingua not Lingua Ignata, I probably would um, would have picked up on it sounding like her because you can definitely hear that in her voice. But yeah, basically, um, it just reminds me of some like gospel music and it's just a really interesting interesting record and yeah i don't have much to compare it to so yeah if if you're if you want to hear like just a, a really interesting take on sort of i guess gospel music and kind of hear like you know lingua ignata sort of in some ways almost doing like a complete 180 from what she was doing but then also still keeping some of that I guess like texture, you should definitely give this. I, I I personally think if you like Lingua Ignata, you should give this a listen at least, you know, to hear where she's going, you know, uh, from this point forward. But um, anyway, what what did you think, Eric? I I liked it a lot. Um, Dan had said to me like, "Have you listened to this yet? Do you know who it actually is, or something like that?" And I didn't, but I knew almost instantly when the voice came in um yeah it, like dan said this is sort of like a, a sacrilegious sort of irreverent i felt slightly or not even slightly but a satirical take on spiritual folk and gospel uh like dan said i think it's really well informed like i think she did a lot of research or at least listened to a lot of these albums um and overall it's super effective and really enjoyable there's some really deep sort of torturous uh seemingly heartfelt moments which um like the lingua ignata records have just running through them completely um the thing about this record is uh so the opening track is really cool but it has sort of like like this damaged recording effects going throughout it and they uh, on the first track especially it's really hard it feels like tape uh slowing down or um like the the electronics cutting out or like your stereo is not working and i i know it's there to establish that this is an old record and um it's sort of like a a unreliable narrator Okay, so that's the term in like a book or a movie or whatever where you don't really trust the person tell the person telling you about what's happening or presenting it or even the presentation of it. And I think that's what they're establishing and I get that. But for me it made it sort of feel kind of novel from the outset. From the very beginning I was like, okay, 
I get it. This is supposed to be like an old record. But that lets up as the record goes on. And I think from there, it it definitely feels a lot less novel like that. And the thing about it is, when I was listening to this, and strangely enough, my pick for this week, uh, but I'll get back to that. Uh, I felt uniquely qualified to address <laughs> this aspect of it um, because I was in a group that tried to do this exact thing, which is like take something presented as a spiritual gospel sort of thing, but the underlying idea is that it's all about, uh, you know, Satan and evil and and things like that. So I un- it, it really is a hard thing to straddle those ideas. Because you want people to know that you're self-aware and that you're sort of attacking faith or at least um, not buying it in, into it completely, you know. But also you want it to be subtle enough that they're not quite sure if you're in on it. Like you want some mystery there too. And so I would say throughout this whole record, there was this sort of like, I knew it was satirical. I didn't believe for a second that this was like, I don't know, like a real scary, weird Christian uh, Appalachian sect kind of recording thing. You know what I mean? And unfortunately, I think it was because of the first track, it was so obvious that it was manipulated that it sort of took me out of that possibility. So that's not me trying to say I didn't like this. I really enjoyed it a lot. But the reason I'm saying all that is like, don't be turned off by that. Like, if you feel it's a little over in the beginning, I agree with you, but stick with it because there's a lot of really cool moments as well. Also, with that being said, the performances and arrangements are pretty spot on and really done well. Like, there's, you know, a lot of kind of gospel singing, kind of like that Alison Krauss, Jillian Welch, kind of old brother kind of harmonies together. Um, The instrumentation is auto harp and smaller parlor guitar sounds, piano, um, you know, all that stuff is right where it's supposed to be. Sounds really great. It still retains a lot of the scary and like damaged elements uh, that Lingua Ignata has, uh, just like Dan said. And some of the really quiet parts of this record are really similar to the really quiet parts of Lingua Ignata as well. Like both of them use a lot of atmosphere, a lot of cool recording techniques to make things sound, you know, sparse and far away and um, overwhelming with the the stillness of things. Like the the atmosphere on this thing is really cool, and it really is effective and disarming. Like, how can I keep from singing as legit terrifying? That's the one Dan was talking about with the uh, speaking in tongues in the background. Um, overall, like I said, I think it's really, really cool. And the only reason I mentioned that sort of novel feeling first track is so that people don't get turned off by that. So, um, but yeah, things that reminded me, obviously, Lingua Ignata's music, uh, very much Diamanda Gallus, like maybe even more so in certain ways than Lingua Ignata. Uh, elements of like the early staple singers, the O Brother, Where Art Thou soundtrack. And what's really cool, like I said, with not only this review, but the one I'm going to talk about, I actually got to think about some bands that I haven't thought about in a really long time, which were bands that we, Old Scratch Revival Singers is who I'm talking about, we actually got to play with or like were part of a similar thing going on. And uh, I don't get, I don't really listen to any of that music anymore. But yeah, I was able to go back and think about some of those bands. So some of those bands that are similar, uh, Those Poor Bastards, Pinebox Serenade, uh, Reverend Glass Eye, uh, The Dad Horse Experience. Like there's a lot of stuff out there that um, this is their goal. I will say this one maybe goes a little harder and a little scarier than all those though. So yeah, I liked it a lot. And uh, it's definitely an interesting uh, direction to go. And yeah, I, I, I want to hear more of it. And I also want to hear more of Lingua Ignata. So good stuff.
Um, yeah, so my pick this week, I do have to say, I think it's really weird when we accidentally pick things that have similar sounds or ideas or, or whatever. Aesthetics. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And we accidentally did that this week again. So my choice was uh, Zeal and Ardor. This record came out in 2022. It's self-titled. Um, I first became aware, aware of Zeal and Ardor quite a while ago um, when their record Devil is Fine came out. I think it was 2017. So yeah, what Zeal and Ardor is, uh, is a fella called Manuel Gagno, who is a Swiss American musician, was releasing uh, music on like 4chan and stuff which i mentioned because it will explain a couple things in a second um and he was sort of taking like musical online challenges like combine these two things or make music like this or something so because of a challenge presented to him he decided to set out to make uh basically music that is the combination of black metal with sort of like antebellum black spirituals so uh his description was what if american slaves had embraced satan instead of jesus so as you can see we are in somewhat similar territory here this is uh strange that i would ever mention this um but at its core i can see that this could be problematic and so i'm just going to say that manuel is Swiss and African American. And so it's not just like, I don't know, some white producers making this kind of music, which, like I said, I would never usually mention that, but I think it warrants a mention here just because, um, you know, that would be pretty problematic. And it still is sort of problematic. But anyway, um, Devil is Fine is the first one I heard. And it was a clearer sort of representation of these sounds. And I uh, I don't know. They became sort of, that was sort of a production. um, Yeah, like I said, like a challenge. Uh, They became a full band after that record and released uh, another record in 2018 called Stranger Fruit and then this self-titled album. Yeah, so I felt The Devil is Fine, uh, like I said, was a clearer representation of this idea. It felt a lot darker, a lot more sparse, a lot more like old and grounded in what it was trying to do um this one just kind of swings for the fences like every musical element of it seems to be the most uh synthesized exact version of that music at least to me there's a lot of things that are really cool about this it sets out to do something really different and it accomplishes that it sets out to to have all these different sort of uh influences and different genres and stuff and it does that perfectly well it mixes blues gospel black metal horror score kind of stuff the uh, melodic death metal electronic music i even had i even think it had sort of an epic folk kind of feel to it like that stomp clap music you know like edward sharp or whatever is that his name (laughs) Um, yes and and all that comes through it's all put together really cool the approach is like just let's throw everything in here and and make it crazy and uh and they do that really well the thing that is the wildest to me though is through all these combinations of styles and genres the one that comes through is uh, for me is this like vocal sound of someone like maybe will whitmore or uh clutch or tom waits or something mixed with extreme music which is what it's supposed to be but unfortunately i think it inadvertently kind of lands in bro country areas a lot of the time or territories or whatever pretty often and that's sort of i think inadvertent i really do like i don't think they set out to do that but with that being said if you are sort of into bro country and death metal or black metal or whatever and very extreme strange 
mashups of music, like I kind of think this would be the best album you've ever heard in your life. So yeah, there, there's all kind. I mean, it's all there. And any element of the music, music styles I've mentioned is there. Like this is perfectly executed black metal, gospel, blues, electronic, like all of it, they nail it. It's really perfect. But for me, it landed in this sort of, yeah, bro country area, which I, I'm not a huge fan of. So, uh, and maybe Dan will have a totally different take on this and that'll be phenomenal. But so things that it reminded me of, uh, at least as far as the reproach or approach and some of the um, uh, even guitar work and stuff, it reminded me of the refused Shape of Punk to Come, which sounds like that wouldn't apply. But really the approach, it, it made me think of that. Stuff like Cradle of Phil, how theatrical that is, Amon Amarth, things like that. But then also Clutch, Tom Waits, Will Whitmore. But then, uh, yeah, maybe Blake Shelton or Florida Georgia Line, or <laughs> I hate to say it, but maybe even like, you know, a little tiny bit of like Bubba Sparks or something. But then also sort of that same stuff I was talking about before, like this dark, aggressive version of folk and gospel and things like that. So maybe something like God, the goddamn gallows or, you know, something like that. Um, overall, I really liked it. I personally like Devil is Fine, the first one, a lot more. But yeah, I think it, it, it's there's nothing else like it. And I think that is worth mentioning. So what do you think, Dan? Yeah, um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, Eric. Um, your take is not too far from mine. So I'm not going to have too much of a different take than you did. Mm -hmm. However, I will say uh, this was really, really shocking to me listening to it, just in the sense that I was expecting something completely different. I I didn't know anything about Zeal and Ardor. I've never listened to them, but I've heard their name, you know, kind of mentioned in like sort of like modern black metal circles, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. are mentioned amongst that. So what I ended up getting was something completely different. And just like you were saying, Eric, there, there's a kind of a lot going on here. The history that you kind of gave about Zeal and Ardor kind of makes it make a lot more sense to me, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, because I was really kind of just sort of like, wow, this is really going into a lot of different areas. And sometimes two songs right next to each other sounded like two completely different bands mm -hmm. from two completely different genres, which I think is awesome. Because not very many people can do that. Not very many bands can do that. And then still have the band of the album sound like one piece of work. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing that I think this album does um, without question does very well. There's a lot of, a lot of genres represented here. Like Eric was saying everything from black metal to again, like Eric was saying, sort of like this bro country uh, very close to like sort of radio rock type sound going mm -hmm. on. There was some elements of electronic music in there for sure. It almost got a little industrial at times. Mm -hmm. And then there's also like some gospel, which was kind of sort of coupled with a lot of the country elements. And um, some of it sounded very cinematic, like, you mm -hmm. know, it sounded very much like it, it, it belonged on like, say, like the Yellowstone soundtrack or something, you know? Mm -hmm. um and yeah. that's not you know i'm not uh i'm definitely not knocking that because i like a lot of that stuff but it definitely did strike me as like I, I was really surprised to hear that on here that all being said it was done extremely well the performances and the production and the just straight up presentation of like what I think they were kind of trying to trying to go for here uh, was like a hundred percent. And mm -hmm. I, I do have to slightly disagree with you, Eric. I sort of got the feeling that they were kind of going for the bro country thing. on oh, the songs. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, for me, and 
either one of us could be wrong and that's fine. <laughs> but for me, it's like, I don't know. I kind of felt some intentional. That's sort of the direction that they were going mm, towards mm -hmm. for, for those specific songs. Yeah. And I, I don't know why I felt that, um, but it, it sounded to me like that was, that was what they were going for. But yeah, it was all really, really, really good stuff. And like, like you said, Eric, um, I think uh, if you're, if any of this sounds appealing to you in any way whatsoever, I think this could be like one of your favorite albums, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. So some of the stuff that it reminded me of, yeah, again, like a lot of the stuff that you mentioned, Eric, Cradle of Filth, for sure, I heard. And really just about any of the sort of um, cinematic black metal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Demu Borgir, mm -hmm. the big production stuff. Some of it reminded me a little bit, uh, there, were, there was a slight like death heaven or something like that kind of mm. going on in some sections. But yeah, then as far as like the uh, country stuff, yeah, some gospel stuff, which I, I can't really like name any like specific artists as far as like straight gospel, but as far as the country stuff, I mean, yeah, I heard some like, um, I don't know, Zach Brown band or something. Mm. Definitely clutch, definitely, definitely a clutch element. Cause there was also some, groove metal elements on here mm -hmm. as well and uh yeah i i heard tom waits and uh on here i actually heard like s some like oh brother where art, art mm -hmm. thou sort of influence um and like i said uh it reminds me of kind of take your pick of any like modern day western you know sort of thing like yellowstone mm -hmm. i could totally hear a lot of this in fact i wouldn't be surprised if a song from this from this yeah. legitimately was on Yellowstone. I would not right. be surprised because yeah. it, it it would fit like perfectly. Yeah, that's um, a good point. I uh, I I hadn't thought of like uh, the Handsome family uh, who does the theme for True Detective, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely like that, like that. Yeah, that kind of sound. Exactly. So, yeah, good call. And some of it also. Like I mentioned the radio rock stuff. So, and this mm -hmm. is, this might come off kind of a little, I don't know, like I, I'm not, I'm not trying to offend here or anything, but some of it kind of came pretty close to something like Nickelback to me or something, you know what sure. I mean? Yeah. And uh, I, you know, so it's, it's definitely something that I enjoyed. I, I think the production on this was mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah. Like I, I just, the production and the performances and everything. But yeah, there definitely was a, a radio rock element, you know? Um, it's not, not everything on here was my thing a hundred percent, but I can totally 100% appreciate it. Yeah. You know, like, so it was, it was a really good pick though. It was a really interesting pick. And I think it opened up, it's, it's one of those releases that kind of really, it opens you up to a lot of different things and a lot of different perspectives mm -hmm. when it comes to like producing music. Uh, Zia Lenarder obviously is going for a specific thing and a specific feeling, a specific sound, because it is one piece of work, like I said, despite how all over the place it kind of is mm -hmm. genre wise. And yeah, they 100% succeeded. <laughs> So yeah, that leads us to our local pick. Keep it local. Um, once again, our friends in Closet Witch are killing it. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Closet Witch, they are an Iowa band. And I can only really say Iowa because uh, there's actually some dispute on where they're from. Um, I happen to know where they're from. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, Corey and Molly, uh, well, first I'll just, 
say who they are. Uh, so Closet Witch is Molly Piatetsky on vocals and uh, Corey Peak on bass, Alex Christ on guitar, and Royce Kurth on drums. We've had, well, actually three of the four members have been on this podcast. Alex was actually the very first guest on this podcast, hmm. but Corey and Molly have both been on this podcast. Mm -hmm. and Eric and I both had the pleasure of talking to them. And anyway, uh, so just to clear it up, Closet Witch is half from Muscatine and half from the Burlington Keokuk area. There's actually a, a, a Facebook page that is, uh, they're insisting that Closet Witch is a Quad Cities band. Quad Cities has claimed Closet Witch. Um, <laughs> but anyway, aside from that, this is their second record. Um, it is called, now, I might get this pronunciation wrong, Kira Skiro, I believe, which is, um, it's an Italian word, uh, which means lightness and darkness. It's an art style that is based on light and dark. And I got to mm -hmm. say that that's the perfect title for not only this album, but just Closet Witch's style. It is really, really heavy as everything that Closet Witch does is. It is raw and just in your face and very intense. It starts off with about a 30 second intro of just, you know, some, it, it, it's kind of a droney sort of, thing going on for about the first 20 seconds before just going into this really heavy riff and then before you know it it goes to the second track and it's just molly is just shredding her vocal cords like i have no idea how she does it her her vocals are just amazing for this type of band and it just it really never lets up it's just a really really intense band and if you've never seen Closet Witch live, I highly recommend it. That is where you get the full Closet Witch experience. They've been sitting on this record for um, about three years now. Um, it was supposed to come out in 2020, but for obvious reasons, that was delayed. Closet Witch have been going through a lot since then, and uh, that has kind of prevented them from sort of being a full-time operating band. But they finally got this out. And um, yeah, it, it is just, it never lets up. Really, really intense. You know, there's not really much I can, much more I can say. It's, um, I think it's even better than their self-titled album. And I also think it's even more raw and even more pure. And one of the reasons why I think the lightness and darkness thing works really well is because if you've ever read Molly's lyrics, they're always touching on, you know, politics, personal reflection. And uh, I mean, like, for example, there's themes on here, content on here that is, you know, just about the ugliness in the world. But then also like, she's got a, she's got a track where uh, that the lyrics are about, meeting a deer on a, on a trail, you know, while she was walking, you know, like in, in a park, you know, things like that. And that's, that's one of the things that I've always really enjoyed about their approach to like this style of music, which is kind of like, you know, you could call it power violence. You can call it grindcore. Uh, you can call it almost black metal-ish and it is all those things, but it really does truly feel like Closet Witch is doing something a little more special within the genre. Um, and I can't quite put my finger on it. And I don't want to put my finger on it. I want to continue not understanding it completely because I think that's exactly why I enjoy it so much. And I'm not just saying that because they're my friends. I really, truly think that when it comes to this genre, they they really are at the top of it. Yeah, just utterly fantastic. And I think if you're if you're a fan of closet witch there's no way you're not going to love this record the other side of closet witch that is fantastic is the visual element the drummer of my band jeff carl actually had the pleasure of doing a video uh for them and the way that they rolled out this album was really really tight they did it with like three really great videos of course 
the bass player, um, Corey Peak. He's a fantastic visual artist in his own right. So is Alex Christ. I mean, they're all just fantastic people, very creative. And yeah, so I'm kind of getting off the uh, trajectory of what the album actually is. But yeah, it's it's really, really intense. Um, as far as the things that it reminds me of, number one, the aesthetic and the way that it is recorded and the way that it is presented really reminds me a lot of early Dark Throne. And that's just because it it kind of almost has a lo-fi element but not really and it, it really does sound like they were going for sort of just this really raw feeling you know this this raw sound and that's exactly precisely what they achieved and so early dark throne really reminds me of that even though you know i wouldn't call closet witch black metal by any means but definitely like the black metal era dark throne albums also like you know converge there's some elements of like Kalesk on here. Um, a lot of the bands that they've toured with, like Full of Hell, I would even say, you know, maybe some stuff like Ill Omen a little bit, or um, what is it? Uh, Biovonic, is it Bio, Bibliophonic Bio Puddle? Is that correct? <laughs> Am I pronouncing I, that right? I think it's a Bovinophobic Bio Puddle. Bovinophobic Bio Puddle. That's correct, right? I believe so. Okay, so I am sorry if you're listening to this, BBP. <laughs> your band is awesome. But yeah, there's just like this intensity to Closet Witch and and a lot of metal bands around this area, to be honest. Um, but Closet Witch is really something special, man. They really are. So uh, what did you think, Eric? Uh, no, I thought this was really cool. Um, it's It goes by so fast that you have to pay attention to it. You, it's not like you can do something else while it's on. Like if you, if you were doing something else, then you, you're, you're missing the point. Like you really have to just listen to this. Yeah. So it's beyond brutal, super heavy, super fast, unrelenting, brazen. Like, I think there's a, like a, a confidence that comes through on this of just, a group of musicians with a unified vision, just like understanding exactly why they're there and what they're doing and, and doing it. Like there's a, just a confidence to that, that that just oozes out of this recording. Um, and the songs flow into each other, like so seamlessly that, it, like I said, unless you're paying attention, you don't actually even know that you're on to the next song yet. A lot of times, like there may be like a single snare hit that is the separating element of the songs and it, that's not to say everything's samey but it just like it flows together so well and seamlessly that like this feels like just one statement you know like different angles of that statement but just like really unified yeah every part of it all the playing every sound the atmosphere it all just adds to the sort of like chaos and for lack of a better word, panic. Like this whole, the whole thing just kind of feels like panic to me. Um, I don't know if that's an enticing description for listeners, but uh, it, it, not much else have I heard that takes it to this level of just, just, I don't know, it's almost anxiety inducing how intense and heavy and nonstop it is and how in your face it is but yeah the guitar uh bass tones are phenomenal they're so heavy and distorted that sometimes it feels like they're verging on like white noise like it's the tones are just so dense and uh just distorted and blown out it's amazing yeah and especially uh they're they're super crushing on the song well-fed machine there's a sort of mm. a middle section where the guitars are just like outrageously heavy. The drums are beyond tight. They never really slow except to exemplify the intensity a little bit. Like, you know how intense it is because it pulls back for, you know, just a second. And yeah, it just adds to the intensity of kind of the terror of the whole thing. Like it just, it's an, it's an intense listen. I don't know how else to say that. 
the vocals are totally just like shredded, distorted, intense, um, very emotionally charged, almost like shocking in their delivery sometimes, just how mm -hmm. brutal it is. Um, there are a lot of, are a few guest vocals on here too. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, yes. and they add a really cool sort of counterpoint to Molly's vocals. And they always sort of support or bolster what she's doing. Like it never distracts or takes away or overtakes what she's doing. Like, and I think that's super important because you wouldn't want someone coming in and just like yelling over her. Cause like, mm -hmm. she's the voice of this thing. That's the way it is. You know, like all the musical parts, all the songwriting, obviously that is part of what this is, but I feel like, you know, the thing that gives it a voice is Molly. So, well, not that she's mm -hmm. a thing, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's actually some really cool synths and organs and stuff that come in various times. Uh, sound really cool, especially on the track, uh, You, Me, and Venus and Decay. I really liked mm -hmm. um, the synthesizers and uh, maybe even programming that's in there. And there are some moments where the songs open up a little bit. They they get to breathe for a second um and in those times it gets nearly pretty you know and just for a second and it almost serves like i said to just show you how intense the other things are but it also might be sort of a reprieve like sometimes uh the those emotions can be as strong as anger or whatever else so uh yeah we met on the park boundary trail um and to the cauldron both of those had sort of these moments where they opened up and got to breathe a little bit as i've said a million times before i'm not very well versed in uh this kind of music uh i only had a couple things like dan said full of hell i had um something like insect warfare or agoraphobic nosebleed like i haven't listened to very much of this kind of grind stuff and in reality, I don't really even think Closet Witch sounds like those things. I just don't have anything else to compare them to. <laughs> and yeah. That's just that's just total honesty there. That uh yeah. but my description of it is how I heard it. And so, you know, brutal, unrelenting, terrifying, uh mm -hmm. panicky, sometimes pretty. Yeah, I think you're gonna love it if you're into extreme music at all. So there's something there for everyone. And and that's actually something else that I was actually going to mention. I was going to bring that up. Uh, you were talking about how at times it almost gets kind of pretty sounding, mm -hmm. you know? I was going to actually mention this in my review and I'll mention it now. The production is almost like, like a, a grindcore take on shoegaze or something. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. there's kind of like this, this element that is almost like white snow or something during those pretty parts, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's, it really invokes number one, that kind of image, but yeah, it has like this really like, like you mentioned it, Eric, kind of like a white noise thing. It, it's, it's a really interesting mm -hmm. or interestingly engineered record, you know? Yeah. There's a lot underneath. There's a lot of like ethereal sort of atmospheric, things happening and i think that mm -hmm. it permeates the whole thing and and it does sort of immerse you in the atmosphere of the album yeah so, yeah and there's really there's i can't think of any other like band that is this intense with songs this quick that mm -hmm. go by this fast that has really done that in that way mm -hmm. like that sort of sound that sort of production on record yeah Good stuff. Yeah, it's really, really good stuff.
Hey, um, <clears throat> did you know <laughs> that um, there might be DIY boy bands? Huh. I no, I guess not. Uh, oh. Well, I don't know if there actually are. I just thought that would be an interesting idea. Like, is there like DIY mm -hmm. boy bands that play like basements with like the grindcore bands and the you know what? Bands? I I don't I don't know about all that. I mean, it'd mm -hmm. be kind of fun to 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 make that happen. But sure, I bet there are DIY boy bands that play things like casinos. You think so? Yeah, and maybe cruise ships, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. like where mm -hmm. they you know where they show up and they have boxes of their own merch and they do their own promotion and right yeah their their cds are like yeah. um in like slip cases with yeah. like black and white photocopied art maybe mm -hmm. uh, yeah well i don't know yeah but I, I guess probably that's just like boy bands that aren't very good <laughs> <laughs> the demos sound like they were recorded on a four track <laughs> yeah like like hissing tape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if if like the Backstreet Boys were like a DIY touring <laughs> band before they got signed to a label. I, <laughs> I don't know how that works. I'd love to know. Cause I there's a very good chance. I mean, really. Like yeah. Like I feel like they could have been doing like uh I don't know, like fairs and stuff right yeah or like yeah. uh corporate um getaways or you mm -hmm. know like performing yeah like corporate meetings and stuff or they could have been playing with know. men's recovery project at some bar in Maybe. cincinnati or something you yeah know? if you're familiar with any diy underground boy bands let us know yeah, send them send them our way. Um, or if you want to start one. I now, mean, obviously I wouldn't be one of the boys, <laughs> but I, I could help with some production or you know, setting up shows or whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> but we did learn a lot today though, didn't we? Oh boy. Yeah, I think uh, we did. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. <laughs> um and uh yeah, um like uh, we always say, if uh, you want us to, if you think there's somebody who we should be talking to or talking about or talking to, yeah, uh, let us know about it. You know, we're, we're easy to find on Instagram mm -hmm. um, and, and Facebook yeah. and Facebook again. Yeah. Yep. Again. Yeah. And, uh, we'll see ya. We'll okay. See ya. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>